morning's meeting for November 17th to order. First thing is the approval of the agenda. Move to approve. Second. We okay, got a motion by Grant, second by Kevin to approve the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 How much chair we have to roll call? <laughs> I had it all done already. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, uh, Commissioner Whalen? Aye. Commissioner Campbell? Aye. Commissioner Mojo? Aye. Commissioner Haney? Aye. Commissioner Gross? Aye. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, did we get any citizens on the... Not, Mr. Chair. Okay. We'll move on to the approval of the minutes from, uh, I think it's. <coughs> move approval. November the 3rd, excuse me. I'll second the motion. We got a motion by Kevin, second by Jenny to approve the minutes of November the 3rd. We'll do the roll call thing. Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney. <coughs> Commissioner Gross. Aye. And we'll do that with the bills also. Uh, we motion to approve the bills. Right here. I haven't we'll seen them yet. I'll make the motion to approve them. Okay, you got them, okay. Got a motion to approve the bills. Where don't we have them? Well, um, yeah. they're not here yet. We, okay, we'll get them later. We didn't get them in the Email, like yeah, I, I'll second the motion. We've got them in the. Yeah. Okay, we've got a motion from Grant, second by Kevin, to approve the bills and vouchers when they appear. All of uh, excuse me, roll call. Commissioner Whalen? Aye. Commissioner Campbell? Aye. Commissioner Mojo? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Haney? Aye. Commissioner Gross? Aye. And with that, we'll go into. Staff reports, uh, Kathy McKay, give our COVID update. You may be able to handle that all by yourself today. Oh, I'll, it's a challenge. I will try, Mr. Okay. Chair. <laughs> Good morning, Good morning. Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I did give you the handout, and I believe um, Commissioner Haney should have received that now. Um, I'm clean. She was trying to forward that on. Um, it, it shows our our Clay County positive cases, um, this was as of 11-16, uh, is 3,841. That's in our Clay County. We are, um, have 50 deaths, so there's a, f a few more than um, the last report. And our 14-day case rate per 10,000 people, again, that's the number we use with the K-12 schools, and it's 123.41. That um, continues to rise as our numbers rise. Um, so, you know, it's higher than we'd like to see, but um, that's the reality of what's going on in our communities right now. Minnesota has a positive case of 231 total cases, 231,018, um, 2,900 deaths, and um, they're, they have a cumulative positive rate of 6.3%. On the back page of this, or on the second to the last page, I guess. We have Cass County numbers as well. They have 13,581 cases, 1,562 active cases right now, 105 Jeez. deaths. Um, they have a cumulative positivity rate of 18.79. For some reason, uh, they did not have their 14-day case rate. So when I checked with the um, North Dakota Department of Health, they did not have that rate for this week. So that's usually what we compare their 14 day case rate with ours. So our numbers are, are rising as you can see, numbers of cases. We have, you know, from November 11th, we had 3,839 um, total confirmed cases by date of testing. Um, so our active cases right now are 847. We're still um, doing the contact tracing case investigation with Minnesota Department of Health, they have hired a number of additional people to do contact tracing and case investigation because there was really a backlog for a little bit. Um, and we have hired three more in the last couple weeks to provide contact tracing and case investigation um, in Clay County so we can cover a lot more of those cases. Those are variable, variable hour 
um, individuals, so a lot of professors and, and other professionals that are doing that um, beyond their regular work. You can see the age range. Um, the highest is, of course, that 20 to 24 range. Um, and then we've got, you know, there's a fair number of 15 to 19 year olds, and then the 25 to 34. So those seem to be our highest ranges that are being affected at this time. I suppose that's pretty much the people that are out working and our students, huh? Correct, yes. The, the community spread is what we're really seeing when we're working with <clears throat> the K-12 superintendents and, and the higher ed. It's really they're seeing um, their students and their staff uh, really acquiring the infection in the community versus in their classrooms. So they are working, um, they're, we're following the numbers and I'm sending the community numbers weekly. I'm also providing information um, for them to make decisions on on what their plans are. Um, we just worked with uh, some of the higher ed um, this week to determine what, what that will look like for them. They not only look at the community numbers, but they also look at what's happening in their, um, in their uh, facilities, like the K-12 schools are really looking at what is going on in their school system. So the districts are looking at what the plans might be. Um, I think Moorhead has made a decision about their distance learning. The other schools will certainly be making more decisions, especially with Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up where they expect that there will be more spread, and we do too, as people go to their homes and, and uh, have their gatherings. The governor um, just last week or the beginning of this week um, in their um, press conference now has decided that Thanksgiving gatherings should not be um, up to three households getting together. That was initially what they uh, thought, small groups, but maybe up to three ho households and they're dialing that back now. So they're really uh, concerned about the growing numbers and the number of hospitalizations across the state of Minnesota and of course with Sanford and Essentia. So they're dialing back to immediate households um, only. So that's their recommendation. It's not a mandate, but people need to adhere to some of those recommendations, especially if you have high risk individuals in your families, um, because they're the ones that are concerning. So you want us to choose between our kids from now on? Huh? Yes. Which one should we call? <laughs> okay. Would you like some of mine? <laughs> <laughs> Decide who you're going to gather with. <laughs> You know, the, di the difficulty, of course, with Thanksgiving is, you know, you're eating, so you can't have masks on while you're eating. No, I and, understand. And uh, you're talking, and maybe you're hollering at your family. That's even worse as you spread the, um, the virus. So uh, they're just, they're, the numbers are concerning enough where they're just um, kind of recommending to people that let's, let's dial that back a little bit. So that's no, the current very, recommendation. It's very serious, yes. Yeah, it is serious, right. Um, so the hospitalizations across Minnesota, they're, they're way over the 90% um, hospitalization rate. I've been uh, attempting for the last couple weeks to get the hospitalization rates, um, the percentage at Sanford and Essentia. Um, I haven't received anything, but I understand their percentages are, are high as well. Well, um, I think, let's, let's stop there, because I think that's the most important thing that um, is one of the most concerning out of all of it is that what is the hospital capacity and what is the ventilator capacity. <coughs> uh, it's no secret that um, they are nearing capacity. They're right. no longer taking transfers um, from certain cases within North Dakota. Uh, so I think that the public really needs to, if there's anything that's a major shift specifically for me is that I, we have almost as many active cases in Fargo and Moorhead right now as we have no longer needing isolation from this entire time mm -hmm. in Clay County. Right. And if we are nearing a point where we have no beds, that's, that's vitally important mm -hmm. for people to know. Right. And we, we will get that information out on the website. I, they don't have it on any of their sites, and North Dakota Department of Health doesn't have it on their site. They have generally the hospitals across the state of North Dakota, but they don't have specifics. I talked with our um, Minnesota Department of Health uh, epidemiologist to see, um, and, and they no longer, uh, 
can cite specific hospitalizations and numbers of Clay County residents. We just got that this morning, so he can't specifically give me. Uh, that's a decision that the State Emergency Operations Center has made. So we have a meeting tomorrow with uh, Sanford and Essentia. So, um, you know, we hope to get some information from them. They, they aren't posting a lot of that, and I haven't been able to receive that from the North Dakota Department of Health. So. Unfortunately, um, I've been making many attempts to get the information. Well, and I know, and, and that's not being critical of you, Kathy. Sure. I, I think it's because Sanford is doing what they can to deal with the onslaught of cases that they're right. dealing with. And so I think they have far more important things than to get a certain number out. Right. What I'm saying is the public that's watching this needs right. to know that we're at a critical level um, with the availability for you to get into a hospital if you do need it. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. Yeah, and I think that uh, Sanford has also, um, and they've also um, had an expansion or will have expansion of beds to um, their Broadway site. However, its staffing is still an issue. They have a lot of individuals, again, affected by COVID or quarantining. So there's a number of um, situations where they're really short staffed. So they're trying to hire as many um, staff as they can, particularly nursing staff is at a shortage. So they're really trying to get more nursing staff and have, they've put the message out that they're, they're really trying to hire more. So, uh, and um, then I just have one more thing and I'll let you finish your report. Sure. Um, I had asked you or late last week about the um, triage that had been set up at the Fargo Dome, the beds for the onslaught of cases because of COVID <coughs> that was taken down early into this. Yeah. And I'd asked if there were plans to put that back up. And you told me no, because there is not staff capacity to do so. Right. And that's something that I've heard in the community, people saying, well, why don't they do that at the Fargo Dome? Our health workers are so strained um, because of the amount of cases, we can't do that. And right. I, and that, people need to he know this. Right, yes, and, that, and that's a fact. It's not like that they would never put that site up, but it is such a large operation to set up a field hospital setting. Um, it is, just like uh, Commissioner Mojo mentioned, it's, uh, it's the staffing. They, they have to have people if they're gonna set up the site and, it, and they took it down. So to, to ramp that back up with all of the supplies and beds, et cetera, is a huge undertaking. So it isn't that they would never do it, it's just not currently right now, that's the plan. They still have beds on their um, North Campus. So um, hopefully they'll, um, we'll, I'll, and again, I'll learn more and we'll, we'll post the information that we can provide on our website and on our Facebook posting. So we'll get more information um, at our Red River Valley Task Force meeting, which is tomorrow, and Sanford and the will have representatives on that group. So we'll get more information from them. Um, I wanted to let you know about the vault testing. So that's still, we still have that um, site in Moorhead, a uh, semi-permanent site. And the last, um, so it's been, it's been going since uh, middle of October. So our last week, of November 8th, we've tested uh, 4,032 um, tests. 2,200 of those were our Minnesota residents and 1,800 were um, other residents, mostly North Dakota. So we <clears throat> the positivity rate, the number of positive results out of that 4,082 was 843. So that positivity rate is 21.09. So it's been running um, the last week before that it was 22. So the, the thing about that site is it's a, a really good option for people to get tested. There's um, no criteria. It's free to individuals. They'll take your insurance card and they can bill insurance, but there will be no bill to individuals. So, and the reason why they're trying to bill insurance is they can recoup some of the costs of having this site so it's, it's a really good um, access for people in our community. Um, there's also a, a swab testing site in Fargo, so that's an option as well. Um, this, our saliva testing site, we understand people are getting results in a very quick um, 
pro uh, it's a quick process and it seems like results are coming within 24 to 32 hours so that's really good that we're getting um, those results quickly so people can either isolate if they're positive um, or not so um, we're not sure how long this testing site will be here we know it was slated through December uh, but we'll see as time goes on it's it's just been um, a great a great resource for our community and getting those testing you don't need a I even was asked do you need a physician order you do not need a physician order you you can go um, you can do a walk-in they're very they're pretty good about shifting people through um, and or you can do an appointment they have appointments um, set up they have um, <coughs> They have increased their hours, so now they were like three days a week, and now they're Monday through Friday. Um, so they've increased the days of the week, and they're also on Saturday and Sunday. So they, they've increased the, their capacity in that regard. So it's Monday through Friday. I was sure I had the time frame here, um, but I can't locate it right now. But Monday through Friday, they're open, and we'll have that posted. It actually is posted on the website and it's posted on our Facebook page as well. So it's gonna be open seven days a week. So there's a little more ability for people to access that site. So that's good. Before it was, it was five days a week, I believe. So I apologize, I, I can't, I don't know where I put that number, but it, it will be posted so people have better access to that site. Um, something else that Minnesota Department of Health is doing is they started a, a texting all of the people that are listed for case investigation or contact tracing. And the reason why they're doing a text message is because we're having a lot of people that don't answer their phones. They're worried about a scam or they're just unsure about the number. So we're missing people in following up when they don't answer. We can leave messages, but we don't get callbacks as well and the Minnesota Department of Health is experiencing the same thing. So they're hoping this text messaging just started yesterday. So they are hoping that there will be a better response. So there's less, it's less time consuming for, for those of us that are following up with these cases to continually call them. So the text message will just say that the state or local public health department is trying to call you about important information. So on the text message, it won't say anything about a COVID test, so it's, it'll be confidential in that regard. It's just saying that we're trying to reach you, so please answer this call and it'll, and it'll give you kind of the area that um, we have some new system for calling, for people calling in. So um, it'll give the number that they will receive when we um, are calling. So we're hoping that will improve uh, the people that will answer their phones or respond um, so we can do the follow-up, provide the education. Um, it, it's hopefully gonna be an effective system to get that text message. So Minnesota Department of Health is texting everyone. Um, so we won't be doing that. But then when we call, hopefully they'll respond. They're, they're texting every positive case? Yeah, they're texting every positive case. So, and then we'll be able to get also those contacts um, once we call them. So we're hoping to capture a few more of those cases that we're missing. There's a lot of cases that just will not return their calls and won't answer their phone. So that, that's a, um, we'll see how effective that is. I think a lot of people are doing the texting, so we think that's going to be an effective means so that they understand it's not a scam that they're um, getting a text message from. Um, the other thing I can mention is our West Central region is working with a, a hospital in Fargo um, to set up a, um, an antibody therapy. It's an antibody infusion. Um, they'll, be getting, um, they'll be getting the antibody infusion um, stuff from, it, it will be shipped to this facility in Fargo, but our West Central Hospital System <clears throat> will be providing, um, they'll partner so Minnesota residents can also receive this antibody testing. Now the FDA put out an emergency use authorization, authorization for this um, to, to permit this, uh, it's a monoclonal antibody therapy. 
Um, and so it's, it's to help treat those mild to moderate COVID cases in adults and pediatrics. Uh, the pediatrics, you have to be at least the age of 12, however, to receive this. And you have to have a certain weight. I believe it's a little over 80 pounds. Um, and so it's those that are high risk for, um, that potentially could have severe disease based on their age or underlying health conditions. So this will be a referral base. So there will be a, uh, a need for a referral to this, um, this site by a medical provider. But um, that's just another means to try to um, assist in those that could go on to, to develop a really an acute um, illness. Mr. Chair, is that, is that, a, is that a, a different therapeutic than the um, blood plasma? Yes. Yes, this is a, this is a different um, process. So what I know is our West Central Coalition, Hospital Coalition, um, is partnering with a hospital in Fargo to support this so those in the West Central region in Minnesota residents um, will be able to um, go to that site. Now, West Central doesn't believe that that um, the information from the hospital system has been made public yet, so I'm, I'm just going to refrain from um, naming that, but um, that's supposed to be happening, as I understand it, this week. So hopefully that information will be out there, but, um, and we'll share it as soon as we know that all that information from that health system is, um, has been made public. I looked and I didn't see anything yet. But that is coming and that'll be a good, um, it will be good for the, the, our metro community because it's not only the North Dakota, but it'll be our West Central. So it, would that be something, Kathy, that, that any <coughs> medical doctor then could refer somebody to? Correct, yes. So, so, so any individual's personal physician would have the ability if, if, if he felt they met the criteria to? Right, that's correct. They'll, de they'll depend on those referrals. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it'll, it's really for those people that are, are really susceptible to developing a, a very severe. Uh, and, and is that something, do we know, is that this type of monochromal, whatever you said that it was, yeah. is, that, is, that, is, that, um, is there an adequate supply of that? You know, I, I don't have the information on how much we're receiving, and I checked with the, my contact at West Central and they don't know the amount yet of, of what the supplies will be that we're receiving. So they'll be providing more information once they receive that as well. So um, that's what we know right now. So it's an infusion. Mm -hmm. You'll be referred from your physician. Um, any medical provider can refer you. And so more information will, will be coming up on that. So we'll provide information. As we receive it, it, it should be out there soon because my understanding was it was going to be coming this week, the supplies. Okay. So I have a few more <coughs> comments and questions, but I'll wait till you're finished with your report. Um, sure. Um, let's see. I think um, um, I want to say maybe that is, that is all I had at this time, other than the governor's, you know, message about um, you know, and he might have more information coming out on um, on further um, restrictions because of the of the rates of infection and the deaths. So, in the next five five to six days, I expect you know uh, the condition to to change rapidly. And so they're really monitoring this, and the governor will make the changes as he um, determines we need to. I mentioned the holiday guidance, so they're really just saying. You know, be very conscientious about um, Thanksgiving, and as Christmas is around the corner, we'll have to be very conscientious about that as well. Um, we do have a, a new, um, there's a new measure that MDH just put out, and it is um, the percentage of, <coughs> the percentage of, it's a risk assessment planning, so it's, um, it's a percentage of risk percentage that one person in a group of 10 could be COVID positive. And so it's, it's a, a new measure. We put that out on Facebook um, and on our website. Um, but it's, um, if you're attending an event in Clay County, 
So one person in a group of 10, there's a 46% chance um, that one in 10 would be positive. In Cass County, it's 50%. So they're pretty close. The 50% chance that one person in a group of 10 um, would be positive. So it's just another um, uh, risk assessment tool that MDH is looking at. So attending events and you're in an, um, a group of 10. Is that, that's, that's, that's different than I've heard that message before. So it's, it's, so it's, it's a percentage, 50% that one in 10 will have it. Correct. I've, you know, it, so is that the, is that the likelihood? Is it also then a 46% chance that if you're in that room, you're going to get it? Well, they, they don't, they don't <laughs> go as far as saying that, but right. you know, if but, you but see there's, that's, that and that you hear different messages going on there, and I and you know, and I think you can probably have um, you know, if you have a room like we are here right now, mm -hmm. uh, and and we're doing what you've told us to do. I don't have my mask on right now. I'm talking, <clears throat> but we're we're plenty of distance apart. Right. You know, and, and then at the appropriate time, we we do wear our masks when we get up and move around. But so just because you're in a uh, a room with 10 people doesn't mean you're going to have a 46 percent chance of getting COVID. Right. It's just the 46 percent. I'm trying to get rid. Of, uh, that's lessen correct. the fear a little bit here yes. too, but it's still it still is very. Right. It's alarming, it's just right. to demonstrate in a gathering the potential of one person in those 10 people being positive. Now again, you know, again wearing masks, um, distancing yourself, um, you know, plays a part. And hygiene. Is that, and, uh, Yes, exactly right. So it's just that if you think about it, if you're in a gathering of 10 and you're in close proximity and maybe people aren't wearing masks, just think about maybe one of those people could be an asymptomatic spreader. Right. It's just right. another tool yeah. um, to, to think about. So you're correct, uh, Commissioner Campbell. Because, you know, I've heard people message that, that <coughs> well, if you're, in a, if you're in a room with 10 people, you have a 46% chance of getting right. COVID. Right, right. That's, that's not what that... That is not what this tool is about. Yeah. It's just to think about this is... The, the <clears throat> community spread is so great that there's just a larger percentage of people um, and they may be asymptomatic spreaders. We're seeing a lot of that. So you're asymptomatic, you've been in groups, you're feeling fine, mm -hmm. uh, then two days later you're ill. So technically you have, you have um, spread that or could have spread that two days prior to you feeling ill, 48 hours prior. Seeing as how you're getting close to wrapping up, I have a question on this chart. And yes. This, this chart is, um, and I, the print gets really faded uh, underneath here, so I, in my uh, aging eyes, I have a hard time <laughs> reading it. But but it um, it talks about total Clay County cases. I, I would really be interested to see um, how this chart looks with active cases. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been pretty outspoken to what age groups I think are, are the ones who really are um, impacting um, this increase in, in this virus. Sure. It, I don't think it's any secret into the age groups that are probably the primary mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And th this, this shows it too. Sure. You know. Um, but I, I think I think we need to draw attention. If you if you have this group here, mm -hmm. that's that's the highest group. Uh, they they don't just stay amongst that age group. Correct. They go to every other age group in one way or another. That is correct. Yes. And so so that that's the point in how we how we how we're going to educate uh, these people that. You can't just freely party with 50 to 100, 150 people. Uh, and just because you might not be able to do it in a bar doesn't mean you should do it in house parties or in a park even, um, you know, with that many people. But Yes. No, I'd be happy to, I'll, I'll have um, those that are looking at all the data, I'll have them graph out our current cases. Yes. I, so I, that would be helpful. And I, you sure can and do that. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll prove me wrong. I don't think it will, but... I think I think Commissioner Haney has got his hand up there. For Jim, did you have some? Well, 
Well, we do know, uh, we, we have... Okay, um, just a minute. Can you repeat that question? Uh, that oh. Okay, um, he was asking about the timeline for the vaccine. So when um, we have our weekly meetings with the Minnesota Department of Health, we believe that the first round of vaccine will be out before the end of this year. Um, and so that's, that's the best they know right now. Those, uh, it will be not a large percentage of doses. So it will be uh, the healthcare workers that receive the first, um, the first vaccine. Healthcare workers that are both in the hospital setting and in long-term <coughs> care, um, caring for people. So they'll receive the first vaccine. Um, we don't know an exact date, but what they're telling us on our, our last meeting that we had just yesterday, um, that uh, they anticipate, they won't give us a date, but they anticipate we'll be out before the end of this year. And those, there will be a variety of ways um, that that will be distributed. So healthcare systems, may get the vaccine. Uh, there's a couple of pharmacies, chain pharmacies, that will also um, have registered as a provider for the vaccine. Um, and of course, um, in public health, we'll be pro providing that vaccine as well. So what we know right now is there will be a small dose or small amount of supply of the vaccine. We aren't even sure if it will cover all of our healthcare workers. We're certainly in hopes of that. Um, but we will be getting that hopefully by the end of this year. Is that the is that the Pfizer? Um, that no, the, I'm not sure which brand it's. I we do know it's the Ultra Cold, one? but it it could be. I I didn't hear what um, which group we're going to get it from first, but I do know it's going to be the Ultra Cold um, supply. Hey, Can we fix this out? Jim, your microphone isn't working. No, it's the. Hmm? Jim, you know, we've got a tough time hearing you. Have you got a mic on or can you turn it up? The mic needs to be here now. Well, we can. Could you repeat that again? So he was wondering about the people in long-term care facilities will be prioritized. It will be health care workers um, initially. Um, because they're the ones providing the care. So healthcare workers um, in long-term care facilities will be in that first group. Yes, the second group, the, the, um, once they receive um, enough doses for all the healthcare workers, the, the next group will be those that are in um, the highest need. So those will be residents of long-term care facilities, those that have high-risk conditions, those that are um, elderly, those will be in the next grouping. Did that answer your question? Okay. Can we put a microphone on that laptop, Steve, or something? Like that one there? Because I think the sound's only coming out of the laptop. Oh, it's 100%. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Is there. While we're doing that, I, I Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to just. I just want to raise a little bit of information here because people at home don't see this and we're talking about it and, and and Kathy gives just the current weekly numbers in her report here but uh, in Clay County uh, as of the week of November 11th we had 847 active cases um, you go back to September 30th and that number was 204 <coughs> So you can see uh, what's happened here in this last month and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's gone up four times, you know, um, and it's, if that keeps going, it's, it, right. it goes to, it goes to Commissioner Mojo's comments about what in the world, where are we going to put these people mm -hmm. when they're, when they're really sick? It's, it's very significant. So when people, uh, talk about um, they're, they're kind of tired of this and tired of the masking and tired of the social distancing. We, we have to work through this. this we're, we're not done with this. There's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, but we really have to be vigilant because our numbers are, just as you mentioned, they're, they're going up. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. We're seeing that in multiple places. So the only thing we have right now until we get the vaccine and get it um, to the general population, which will be a while, um, we really have to just be vigilant about 
about the social distancing yeah. and in the masking in public places and um, it's it's a concerning number there's no doubt that I don't you know that, and, and I and I want to make one more comment to you to any employers who might be out there if you have an employee who is recalling in and reporting sick please don't tell them to come to work yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right and and we are very clear with all of our case investigations and contact tracing we're very clear about um, you know, you, if you're positive, you must stay home for 10 days. There's, I mean, that's just a given. And, and if you're still running a fever or your symptoms aren't improving, you're staying home longer than that. And so um, many employees that we're working with are ensuring that either we send a letter, so public health is sending letters to individuals to tell them when they can go back to school or work. Uh, we're providing a lot of those. So workplaces are asking for when are you done with your isolation or when are you done with your quarantine? That's 14 days. That's if you've been a contact. Um, we're also telling them when to get tested, um, if you need to get tested during your quarantine period. That's the five to seven days after you've been um, in contact with someone. If you get tested right away, it more likely will be negative, and then it's a, a false negative. You may get infected in a few I, more days. So. I, I, th I think most employers get it, and, they, and they're understanding this. Um, I, I just happened to know this weekend of somebody who had several of the symptoms. He called his employer, and his employers had come to work, oh. and I, that's just unacceptable. It is, and when we hear about those um, uh, those businesses, we do reach out. And, I'll, and I'll share one with you. Okay, that'd be great because we will reach out to them. And um, I've got I've received a few calls, and our um, environmental health specialist has also received calls about businesses and he will call them and or make a visit to ensure that they're following um, this particular is, this particular business isn't in in moorhead or clay county okay. but it's it's in yeah. our community okay so we we need to i know i've i've heard um some on the cass county side too so we mm -hmm. share that information with officials over there so they can follow up as well yeah i think the one thing we've noticed there there aren't any figures that are going down. They're all going up. Right. You know, so it's, there's nothing to say that's getting better. No, that, that is correct. So you're really not coming with any good news this week, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the vaccine may be closer. Uh, therapeutics, I think those are um, important things. And I, I had shared on social media this week, I, um, you know, I've been on quarantine two different times because of close contacts, and it is very difficult for a lot of people trying to manage uh, what loss of income may be or um, teaching kids from home. Uh, there is a huge strain on the community, but I think it's important for people to know that the, the more mindful you are right now of your actions and your interactions will help us uh, to keep kids in school. It will help to keep these businesses open. It will um, help us to move forward. We do, I've heard this long winter thing, you know, uh, we are going into normal flu season anyhow, so mm -hmm. folks are getting sicker and maybe not outside as much, but the more we can do, you can do personally to limit your exposure, just helps everybody. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to be, oh, that's government telling us what to do. It's not. It's just be careful. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mojo, I've seen um, um, okay. unfortunately, COVID has hit us in this room. It has. In the worst way. Mm -hmm. And Kevin is not the only person that has tested positive in this room. Mm -hmm. Kevin is the only person that has lost somebody very close to his heart. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfair. It takes no prisoners. But he doesn't want to sit here and preach to everybody. <coughs> right. But it can hit you when you're not even expecting it. It can. And it can I I've, seen, I've seen people who... Um, have suffered from economically from it. Um, you have a better chance of recovering economically 
than you do if you're die if you're if you if you died. Yeah. And uh, yes, it it can hit anyone at any time, and even those that take precautions. There's not a hundred percent guarantee that you um, <coughs> can prevent it either. I mean, we do the yep. best we can. Masking, social distancing is um, our means right now, but it is not 100%, but it's the best measures we have um, before we get that vaccine. So those are what we need to do, and, and everybody needs to think about um, all the people they're around. And I think that quarantine period is a, uh, it's so tough to understand sometimes. I mean, <clears throat> You may have COVID and you may have high fever, but you get over it, but you still got that quarantine period to wait out of, but you feel good. So you think, well, I'm feeling good. I can go out, mm -hmm. but you still should, uh, mm -hmm. st I mean, go through your quarantine period. And I think that's where, I mean, I know I went through it. Uh, I felt good after a while. I mean, after a few days, I felt okay. But. You have to wait out your whole period and it's just until uh, you can go back into the public again. That's correct, Mr. Chair, because as, as we've talked about, <clears throat> the 14-day period is when you can become symptomatic. When the 10-day isolation, when you are positive, uh, that's the period of time where um, your symptoms will resolve, but also the virus lessens, so you become um, not contagious at that 10-day mark. The 14-day period, uh, we have people that become symptomatic on day 12. So you, you can then start spreading it. We have people that quarantine for 12 days. They become symptomatic, and so they're positive. They have to go now 10 more days. So um, it's a long period of time if you think about 12 days of quarantine. Now I'm positive. I have to now be 10 more days isolated. The so, tough thing is to understand sometimes. If you're in the same household, one gets it and one doesn't get it, you know. How does that work out, you know? It's just uh, your immune system more, more than likely it's different, but. Uh, That's right, and, and how, how, <coughs> how conscientious you are. There's a lot of variables in your own household because obviously if you have young children, the parents can't stay away from their children, so they have to take care of, of uh, those kids, but it's being conscientious about wearing your mask, trying not to, if you're adults, you know, and one is positive and one is not. You're not going to sit and watch television together. You know, you really need, we, we tell the positive case, if you can go to another bedroom and stay isolated, don't be in the kitchen at the same time, don't be in the living room at the same time. You really do try to keep separated to avoid passing it on to the other individual in your home or other individuals. <clears throat> so, um, you know, you do the best you can, depending on your situation in your home. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you for the re update again. And, uh, yes, thank uh, you. Very enlightening and, and concerning. Thank you very much. Okay, there we we'll go to the CARES Act Committee. Uh, Steve, uh, I don't know if Darren's going to be here or not. Uh, just me this morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, just wanted to, to provide a brief update here on CARES. Uh, as we get closer to uh, December 1st, we're, uh, we're wrapping up some of our committee work. Um, we've been meeting uh, weekly now instead of twice a week over the last uh, few weeks, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work that's going on uh, uh, behind the scenes outside of those meetings. We're working currently with our, uh, with our department heads and, and with Joe uh, to uh, ensure we get our invoices in uh, for that December 1st uh, deadline. Our goal is to try to have as many of those uh, payments uh, from our vendors that haven't been done to this point uh, to you uh, in bills and vouchers by next Tuesday. Uh, and hopefully just being able to wrap up a, a few minor uh, on that uh, December 1st meeting. Uh, it was a, a very exciting day yesterday. Uh, as as uh, many of you uh, went out to the DMV location at the Morehead Center Mall, uh, that, uh, that location uh, did open. Uh, we, uh, overall, it went uh, pretty smoothly. Uh, we did have some issues uh, with the state on the state level. Uh, not only are we moving locations, but during this process, the state of Minnesota moved from Min Lars to Min Drive, uh, and uh, there were a few different issues uh, from the Min Drive perspective uh, that caused a little bit of a delay for, for some of our, our citizens. But overall, I think it was very well received. Uh, we uh, did add some additional seating about midday uh, for, for, uh, for 
our citizens to make sure that uh, they didn't have to stand. Uh, but uh, I think in talking with people yesterday when we were out there, I think there's a, uh, they were very pleased with the space. I think uh, there's many people that talked about uh, just the atmosphere of the Morad Center Mall was much different yesterday, just, uh, just with the addition of, of, of the people. And, and so uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to continuing that relationship and, and working through some of the, the little hiccups, but it certainly was a, was a very good day yesterday. Uh, and, and I would, would uh, just briefly like to, to uh, note, to, to thank um, uh, Lori and, and Chelsea Sylvester and her staff, uh, Mark and Tim uh, from our IT and also Joe for making that happen. Uh, basically, we, we tore down on Tuesday at, at uh, two, at 2 in the afternoon and staff worked through Veterans Day and through the weekend to make sure that, uh, that we were ready to go yesterday. And so, uh, so we thank them for all their good work. Um, we, uh, we are going to be closing on the, uh, the administrative building down in the south, uh, south Moorhead uh, next week, a week from today, I think 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and we also are going to be wrapping up a number of our projects here on campus uh, and on the 15th Avenue uh, garage area by December 1st. Uh, just to give you guys an update, we, we were having some challenges getting laptops and tech. Um, um, and some of the infrastructure in that we had, had uh, this board had approved. Uh, the laptops did come in last week, and so uh, we were pleased that, uh, that they got in before the deadline. Um, and then just uh, last, uh, we, we did uh, the cities and townships uh, CARES uh, funding window ended on Sunday, uh, and so the townships have until uh, the 20th uh, this week to return any funds that haven't been used uh, to, uh, to the county, and so the CARES committee uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look at uh, what remaining requests that we have out there. If you, if you do uh, take a look at it, hand out the, the most updated uh, graph. Uh, right now, we have a total do dollar remaining of uh, $68,024. I can tell you that there are a number of uh, different items that we have outstanding. Uh, and so um, that is kind of where we're at. And any additional funds that we would get, we would add to that add to that uh, dollar amount. And, and again, as I mentioned, we've, we have some different ideas of to spend those funds should they come in. So with that, uh, stand for any questions. Sure. The, um, one of the things that I brought up at the CARES meeting was um, the potential for um, public information regarding donating um, COVID plasma for people who, it's a therapeutic that can be used. It, it's that the science isn't out on whether it, it works completely or not, but it's something that uh, is certainly um, a tool that um, they like to be able to have. And, and I don't think, you know, as these numbers rise, um, the, the one aspect of it is there's more, more people who have these antibodies now. And um, when I, you know, I, again, I have a personal experience where I, somebody was in there and there was limited supply of plasma. And the person probably, you know, this individual probably didn't get, you know, the amount that may have made a difference. And, um, so I, I, I encourage, and I, you know, I told Kathy to check into it. I, I think if <clears throat> some of these remaining dollars, even if we have to spend some of them to do a public promotion of, of, uh, of the um, importance of being able to donate that plasma, I think it would be money well spent. And, uh, I know, Kathy, you're going to research that. Yes. And I, I think the sooner, uh, the sooner we can do that, the better. We are working on that currently right now as we yesterday, so. Thank you. Sorry, I Thank you. Commissioner Campbell did get, or Commissioner Haney did get dropped, so. Oh. Okay, we'll wait a minute to see if we can get him back on.
while that, while that's waiting, that the um, you know for those people that donate that COVID plasma, there's there's also um, a good financial uh, deal for them, uh, incentive for them to do it too. So it's uh, not only are you helping uh, those who are sick and suffering, uh, but you're also able to. Is there a contact, Kathy, to uh, to donate or? Uh, I don't have that information with me, but we're, we're going to we'll provide that. There, there are um, there are a couple locations right in Moorhead that yeah. that do it, and there's also some in, on the Fargo side. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I if we can get that on our website, that we'll be post that on the website. Okay, I have one question on the as far as these CARES Act funds. I know we're purchasing purchasing that building up uh, there in Twelfth Avenue. And I know in our meetings now, we, there's a lot of work yet to be done. I mean, you don't just move into those buildings. Is there CARES Act fund to take care of some of that uh, reconstruction that needs to be done? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, there's not. In our discussions, uh, December 1st is, is the cutoff for that funding. Uh, and so we obviously will, won't be able to uh, do the, the necessary changes what we've talked about I think in the cares committee uh, and I think br briefly at least during the board meeting is that we would be looking to spend the reserve dollars to, to fit up the, the necessary requirements for that building okay thank you part I'm part of what's included in the building still though the, the uh, cubicles some office um, equipment will be paid for with the CARES Act funding. So uh, as that went into the purchase price, so that will be covered by that. So there'll be less dollars that we'll have to rely on the levy to purchase to fit that up. But but you're right, it is, um, there are some some tweaks to the building to be made and that will need to come out of reserves. Yeah, I think there's gonna be quite a few tweaks to be made yet to fit everybody in there properly. Okay, go ahead. We lost Jim, I guess. Yeah, the laptop is not. We're having technical issues on our vehicle. There's help coming. Frozen out will come back up. Whatever, Jim, if you have access to your phone, Jim, maybe we could give you a call. I don't think he can hear it because he's. Because he got dropped from teams. So. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna take a break. Okay, I think what we're gonna do is take a short break for about five minutes. We'll be back shortly. Okay, we'll go back in session again, and uh, I guess we're still are we fin finished with the um, CARES Act uh, update? Oh, you got more? I, I have nothing else, Mr. Chair, unless there's additional questions. Okay. Okay, with that, we go with Joe. Joe, you up there? Okay. Uh, requesting to build Maine's restructuring plans. Good morning. Good morning, Joe. So yes, uh, I'm here today to request approval to um, go ahead and start implementing the uh, restructure plan for the building maintenance. Um, just a little history, maybe about a year ago we started developing this plan. Just uh, We had anticipated a couple long-term uh, retirements that were going to happen within the next year or two. And uh, so we started developing this plan here. And um, with the addition of the, the buildings over the years, um, we felt that, that um, it was something that was needed. So what we've, uh, what we've done, does everybody have a copy of the? Yes, we do. Okay. So um, what we've done is, um, this is what we'd like to do is, um, we've already had one of the retirements happen. And um, we feel that when this happens, is a good time to transition to this. And uh, what we'd like to do is um, implement this in a couple different phases. 
Uh, phase one, we would create the facility manager position January 1st. And with this position, we feel that having a better representation of, of the, all the colony buildings on and off campus is what, what would be added to this position. Um, but uh, what we'd like to do is in phase two, when the second long-term employee that's still currently right here uh, retires, we'd like to implement that and add an operations supervisor and a custodian lead and administrative assistant. Um, with this is we're not adding any employees or anything, we're just restructuring. And why we're doing it in phases is because um, I think the benefit um, we'd be able to, uh, in between phase one and two, we'd be able to train with that long-term employee that's currently going out and, um, and then uh, be able to do that. So um, yeah, other than that, I didn't want to get into the details of the flow chart, but if you had questions, for me, um, it, once phase one and two would be implemented, we'd have a cost savings of 29,000, roughly. And then uh, we've ran this through the PIC committee, they've approved it, so um, I guess I would open that up for questions for you. Mr. Chair, we, we had uh, lengthy discussions about this at PIC last week and uh, agreed that it was, was the right plan at the right time. Uh, we also discussed it back in June, uh, at, at length and uh, and it was a good plan then it's still a good plan and uh, and and like I say at pick everybody agreed it's something we should move forward with yeah I do want to thank Joe for planning ahead on this uh, you know looking at it looking at this department and looking at where you can probably save some money and stuff like that and I think it's a great plan and uh, like I say uh, I think we should move forward with it just a comment. I, I think that this plan makes sense. I agree. You've talked about it before. It made good sense in the summer. We've added two different locations since yep. then and, um, and another building for public health up north. So it, it really makes the most sense for now. I also want to say that this action, in my understanding, um, is not any, any rush to when you anticipate those retirements to be. Yep. I, I certainly mm -hmm. um, want those employees to know that they're continued to be really part of the uh, critical parts to this, this process. Yep. So um, it's, it's nothing to push anybody towards retirement faster or anything. It just, this is the situation that we're in. So I, I think it really will help in the future to allow um, for the best management of, of the buildings. And, and I agree, both both Georgia and you have done a mm -hmm. fantastic job in managing our, our buildings. I, I, yeah. You've just yeah. done a great job. So thank you sure. very much for that. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, just to add on that too, Commissioner Mojo, uh, I definitely, the knowledge that Georgia has is she's gonna help me train on some of the stuff she does. And so she's very critical to me and has always been. So just wanted to put that out there. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the request for the restructuring plan. Okay, we've got a motion to approve. Second. The request and a second. Motion by Grant, second by Kevin to approve the restructuring plan. Roll call vote. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call. Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney. And uh, Commissioner, Mr. Gross. Aye. Okay. Anything further, Joe? No, nope, that's it. I appreciate your support on this, and we'll we'll get working on it. So. Hey, thanks. Thanks right, for thanks. doing this. Good work. Okay. Now we're going to go into purchase some custodial equipment for the South Campus, or I guess we're going to have to decide sometime what we're going to call that building. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, we did have some discussion on that, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and yeah, we'll be, we'll be bringing forward uh, uh, something uh, later. But yes, uh, as you guys are aware, we, we've purchased uh, the South Campus and we need to outfit that with custodial equipment. Uh, Georgia has put together a list on the back uh, sheet uh, of uh, $10,375 uh, to, to outfit to that, uh, that building. And so the request before you uh, uh, would be uh, to approve that. Uh, this did come to our committee and we looked at it and it all seems to make the most sense for that location So I'll make a motion to support Second Okay, we got a motion by Jenny and a second by Grant and, uh, 
I do have to say, I, I don't know if we're going to move ahead with this yet, or are we going to look at possibly comparing prices, uh, uh, whether we're going to hire cleaning people? Or yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we we are we do have we have Georgia uh, today. We're going to have uh, some vendors go through through the location just to look at uh, a cost comparison. Uh, we felt that uh, that if that's a, a better deal, lower price, that, that's certainly something we'll consider. Uh, we're not going to make any purchases here until uh, until that decision is made. We've asked our vendors to have uh, have their uh, their information to us by this Thursday, uh, and so. Uh, in the event that uh, in the event that it's determined this is the the best price, we would make this purchase uh, and would need to probably do that quick sooner than later. So we wanted to bring this before you this morning. But there is a possibility that uh, that we may be going down a different avenue. Mr. Chair. Yes. We also discussed that at uh, our CARES Act, and, and the, a lot of the stuff is stuff that needs to be in the building, uh, whether we move forward with a contract or not, um, and and. There is a deadline for the CARES Act funding, and so if if we do approve this, and like uh, Steve said, if it appears that this is not something we need, at least we could cancel the order. Um, I'd rather do that instead of having to quick scramble to get board approval for this. Okay, I agree with that. Okay, we had a mo motion. Uh, I don't know who it was Jenny and uh, Grant. Um, any further discussion? Roll call vote. Commissioner Whalen. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Mojo. Aye. Commissioner Haney. Aye. Commissioner Gross. Aye. And I would just note, uh, Mr. Chair, that this uh, the funds will come out of the COVID infrastructure mitigation okay, category. Sorry. Okay. With that we're going to go into staffing at the detox center. And have Kathy back again along with Troy. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Troy and I are, are here to request um, uh, a couple of staffing changes. So over the past seven months, we've lost some variable hour staff and we're challenged to Thank recruit yes. uh, variable hour staff. Troy has been working on the schedule rigorously to get all the shifts covered. Um, that means people have to put in additional hours. And so it's been a challenge. So what we've requested, and we did, um, we did uh, vet this through the uh, personal issues committee as well. But we have two open variable hour positions that we were have not been successful in filling. And so on the wage uh, sheet that Troy just handed out. So we had a, a 0.2, which is a variable hour RN position, and we have a 0.4, again a variable hour LPN position. And so we'd like to um, um, adjust those and uh, move those um, uh, budgeted positions to increase a technician that we currently, um, and these are technicians that we currently have in our staff. One is a 0.4 to a 0.6 benefited position. A 0.4 is variable hour, no benefits. And then the second position is moving a 0.6 uh, technician to a point eight, and that way he would have better coverage um, than we do right now. It's been ch just so challenging to cover all the shifts. So this will um, help in having uh, more hours for those technicians to cover shifts that are open and vacant. Okay. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. In terms of medical training requirements, uh, how does that change? Uh, if I understand this right, the very the part times they still have to be either RN or LPN. Yeah, yeah we still have the, uh, you know, we're, these these positions that we had have just been open. We have not okay. been able to fill those two positions, RN and LPN. We still have our coverage with the uh, LPNs and RNs okay. that are required for our licensure. And that was my question. If yeah. we got rid of this and moved to the other piece, does how does that change? Right. Right, those, those we've been, these were additional um, nursing staff that we've attempted over a long period of time to fill, but it's hard to find a, a variable hour. Point two is, is variable hour. It's, it's really hard to recruit nurses to be able to just fill in as needed. 
mm -hmm. um, and the LPNs as well. It's been challenging. Yeah, I think um, the, the, using these two positions that we haven't been able to fill, we still are left with um, enough, what I feel, of variable hour positions. If we can find those nurses, okay. um, I think we still leaves us four, four or five variable hours. Okay. So if we can find them, um, I just think at this point, um, a lot of the staff have been working extra hours. Yep. They've been doing whatever we need to do. They've been great, um, but uh, the, this week is especially challenging. So um, getting these good technicians to assist the nurses yep. is almost as important as, as having the nurse. So. Yep. Well, thank you for your flexibility. Yep. This is another item we discussed at length at PIC last week, and uh, we're in agreement that it's uh, the right, uh, right time to do this. So. Given that, I make a motion to approve this plan, Mr. Chair. Second. We've got a motion by Grant, second by Kevin to approve the plan for the restructuring of the public health. Um, any further discussion? Roll call. Commissioner Whalen? Aye. Commissioner Campbell? Aye. Commissioner Mojo? Aye. Commissioner Haney? Can you get him out? Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Gross? Aye. And okay. We're, st we're still operating at uh, you know less bed capacity just because of the staffing um, needs um, that we've had. So we haven't been able to operate in our full 16 bed capacity. So our hope is to eventually be able to expand that again. But we need people to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for your support. Thank you for your work. Okay, with that, we're going to go into committee reports. Uh, I don't know, can we, Jim, can you, uh, do you have anything to report or can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you. But on uh, Thursday last week, I attended the Clay County Soil and Water Conservation District meeting along with Commissioner Mojo. We heard uh, other, other different reports, and uh, that's my report. Okay, thank you. Grant? Uh, I had a uh, PIC meeting last week, and uh, we've uh, addressed those issues at today's meeting. And uh, then I had a diversion update meeting with uh, the executive director, Joel Paulson. And uh, it's more pleasant now to have those meetings now that things are getting resolved. So everything's going, moving ahead uh, fairly quickly now, and uh, it's all positive. So that was it for me. Okay, Jenny. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, last week, <clears throat> excuse me, I attended the um, Lakes and Prairies Homeless Support and Prevention Programs meeting. There was a good update. There's lots of grants that have been awarded through the CARES Act. Uh, specifically, Lakes and Prairies was able to secure an $800,000 grant to address those issues as part of the CARES Act that Commissioner uh, Campbell and I are on. We were really happy to hear that they were able to secure that. So they're working through that. As you had a report from uh, Steve on that earlier, I think they've uh, only been able to pay out about 35 or 36 percent of that grant. Um, it's certainly not because of need. There definitely is documented need within the community and those applications are pending. They're working through that. They're uh, running into a capacity and staffing issue. So they're uh, trying to address that as soon as possible. Their deadline for that um, uh, uh, grant specifically is the end of the year. They felt confident that they were able, they would be able to work through that um, and get as much of the dollars out in the community <coughs> as possible. The federal government guidelines have um, given them a little bit of um, inclination as to if there would be more funds available. They certainly um, have been told that there would be, so we'll work through that. And as uh, COVID definitely <coughs> moves on, we know that need is not going away. So uh, great work from the staff and uh, partners there. Um, and then uh, I did attend the SWCD meeting with Commissioner Haney. And good updates there. They're also trying to work through how you, how we safely work with residents uh, in, in uh, ex exposures and offices. So they're continuing to do the work that needs done there. And then yesterday I attended the CARES Act committee 
we've addressed all of those issues. I did see yesterday that our AMC policy groups are, continu are starting to meet uh, now on that, so um, watch. I almost missed it in my email, so watch for those meetings coming up. I believe that concludes my report. Soil and water, con they had some change in uh, supervisors there too, the, the election. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Um, I think the new supervisor coming on, his last name is Anderson. Uh, uh, thank Anderson. you for saying that. Both Commissioner Haney and I um, have felt uh, Richard Menholt has really been a strong advocate for rural Clay County on that board. He's done a, a great job, was particularly helpful when, in the buffer implementation and critical of the plan, but also willing to move forward with, with farmers to find out what the best option for the, why are the, the district was. So thanks for, thanks for saying that. Kevin? Uh, uh, yesterday we had the CARES Act Committee. I think that's been gone over quite well, so I don't need to go into that anymore. Then um, last, um, on November 12th, I attended the Lakes Country Service Cooperative meeting. Uh, a couple of items of interest there. Um, they, they did put out a new contract for the services that further provides for us, uh, dealing with our um, medical flex plans and VIVA and that type of stuff. And, and um, further did come in, they, they did award another three years to further and the good news there is that the the fees went down and the investments that uh, further has been able to get as a result of, of the funds went up so that's a net really good thing uh, I don't know just exactly how how that will um, what the price per person that we pay for for that what those fees will be yet but it, I'm assuming it will uh, certainly be no more, hopefully it'd be less. And then there was another, uh, received another report that, uh, and this is something of interest for any government employee, that there is a, there is a student loan relief fund that's available to um, government employees who are associated with Lakes Country Service Cooperative. And um, I don't know to, to what extent we might have employees with the Clay County that um, that have student loans, but one of the things that they've done is the, um, an example here, the, the average original loan, student loan payment was $650 a month, and by going through this program, the average new monthly payment went down to $128 a month, so there's some significant opportunities for people to, to maybe deal with their, with their budgets. Um, I will turn these documents over to um, Steve and you can get them to Darren and I think we should, you know, through our county uh, paper that we put out, um, let our employees know about this and it's, an, it's a, uh, as far as I know, there's no cost to the employee to um, use this opportunity, so that concludes my report. Okay, I attended the PIC meeting that Grant talked about. Uh, a couple other things we discussed there was wearing a mask throughout the campus, and that was discussed. Uh, uh, we're also talking about the inclement weather policy. Um, I know we have a policy of uh, we don't close down here at the county. Um, however, we have a lot of people working from home, so it sort of took a, on a different light to, uh, as far as who can work from home and who can't, uh, you know, is that policy going to have to change somewhat or not? And we had discussion on that. Um, and then we also had some discussion on the public defender contract. Uh, um, from there, uh, Friday morning, I had um, a partnership for health meeting. We had a virtual meeting there. Um, just a lot of the discussion on what different counties have, how they've changed as far as with schools, testing sites and stuff like that. Uh, they're also looking at getting more dental help uh, within, the, within the four counties. Um, 
and I also was lucky enough to be one of the chairman of that um, committee. So, lucky, lucky. Uh, let's see, building committee Friday afternoon and yesterday. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this moving of this out to this new building out of the 12th Avenue South. Uh, we're working with Clyde McCarthy, and he's come up with a lot of. I mean, we've given them information that we need, where, how much space each department needs, and he's come back with some very good information how to place everybody into this building. Uh, it's going to be a, it's not just going to be a moving thing. We're going to have to replace probably, uh, put up some minor walls and, and stuff like that. And uh, but some of those cubicles uh, that are going to be left out there are going to be moved around, and um, there's going to be a lot of work involved in that. Um, to get everybody in there. Um, also, Monday morning, I had a general government policy committee, uh, the AMC with general government policy committee meeting. Um, we had uh, Chairman Paul, the House Tax Chair, Paul Marker, talk and give a very good explanation on what their plans are and well, how they're going to probably have to go to reserves to even out their budget and stuff like that. And Senate Tax Chair Roger <coughs> Chamberlain also gave a presentation there. Um, uh, one of Paul Markert's pretty, pretty adamant and uh, keeping a hold on a line on property taxes. He doesn't want to see any increase in property taxes. Um, they feel like, I think they got two and a half billion in reserves. Uh, they may have to dip into that a little bit. Okay, those are my meetings. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, kind of on two, last Tuesday, I participated in the PIC meeting that uh, has been addressed. I also had a department head evaluation and uh, toured the uh, DMV at that time. Also talked that afternoon, talked with Greg Stroman uh, from the Clay County uh, Snowmobile Trail Alliance. Uh, they did receive their grant this year that we act as a sponsor on their behalf. Uh, and so we just talked. Uh, Talked about some of that, uh, those issues. He also mentioned they are, they did have a, they're currently having discussions with one of our, our townships uh, who's requested a, a change in the, uh, uh, using some of the areas for the snowmobile trail, and so they're trying to work work through that with our township. Uh, on uh, on Wednesday, uh, had uh, phone conversations with Matt Hilgarth from AMC, uh, kind of about our CARES program, uh, and uh, and we talked a, a little bit about. Uh, a media request that they had about the deadlines and how impactful they are. I think that uh, we've we've talked a great deal about that in our cares uh, cares committee. With you know, we had hoped when when the funding first came out that uh, we would uh, we would have a vaccine by now and we'd be worrying uh, working through a mass vaccination with some of those funds. Uh, and uh, and so AMC is uh, kind of leading that that charge of the challenges that we have now with the funding uh, being gone December first. Uh, what uh, what uh, uh, we may, what we'll need, I guess, once uh, once we do re have those mass vaccinations in 2021. Uh, on the 12th, I uh, uh, met with uh, Brian and, and Tony on, on uh, some of the closing documentation uh, for for the uh, South Campus building. On the 13th and yesterday, participated in the building committee uh, that uh, Commissioner uh, Campbell, or excuse me, Commissioner Gross has, has mentioned, and also uh, yesterday participated in the CARES committee that's been addressed. Uh, and yesterday, went again and toured out at the DMV. Just a note, uh, I think uh, each of you commissioners will have received your uh, a, a registration for AMC annual meeting uh, on Monday, December 7th, and the afternoon, I believe it's 1 to 4.30. If you're interested, uh, let clean and I know and we'll make sure that you get registered. That concludes my report. Anything further? I think just to note that uh, I think you had reported that Pangea would be online this year with the Historical Society, their uh, cultural event that they have every fall. So you can go on to their website and, and follow all those stories. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. One other item, uh, I'd like to welcome Jenna uh, to our meetings. Uh, she's going to be representing District 1 in the future for up here in the commission. Welcome to the group here. Brian, did you have anything? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. We're adjourned.